necessary because you need to check that a transaction is valid, right? And the, one of the validity concerns is checking that the sum of the uh, inputs is greater or equal than the sum of the outputs. Um, the problem is that every transaction is public on the blockchain, so everybody can see this. So the privacy leakage is, is quite concerning. And there's been a lot of work on trying to improve this. Um, and all of them rely on this tool, these zero knowledge proofs of knowledge or zero knowledge arguments of knowledge. And what a zero knowledge argument of knowledge lets you do, it lets you say that I have a witness to a statement such that the statement is true. So on a very simple level, this could be the statement could be a Sudoku and the witness could be the solution to the Sudoku. So I can say I know a solution to that Sudoku such that, um, such that the Sudoku has a solution, right? Not every Sudoku has to have a solution. But I'm going to give you no information whatsoever about what the solution actually is. And um, this can be done through some interactive protocol. Um, and you know you need to have these properties that an honest Peggy can convince a victor. It's also sound, so Peggy cannot convince victor if she doesn't actually know the solution. And um, you have the zero knowledge property, so that every valid um, uh, transcript can be simulated by the verifier. And what that means is that the verifier, Victor, doesn't actually learn anything more than the fact that is trying, uh, that is being proved. It's not clear who would do this interaction, so we really need these non-interactive proofs where Peggy can just write down the proof and convince uh, Victor. And uh, the, this is also what is being used in Zcash, and here the statement that is being proved is a lot more complicated. Um, you basically prove that you know a Merkle tree path in this path uh, to like two unspent coins, and here are two new coins such that the sum of the old coins is equal to the sum of the new coins, and then there's some more stuff. Um, and this complicated statement can be expressed in a circuit, and then we can do a zero knowledge proof such that the statement is true. However, if you look at this, all that the verifier will learn is that there are some unspent coins that have been spent. They don't, the verifier learns nothing about what is the actual uh, value that is being transferred or which coins are being transferred. So there's no linkability, no, um, uh, and no values revealed, and really, really nothing is revealed. So we have great privacy. Um, and the, the, the tool that has uh, been used to do this that Nicola talked about uh, right now are these pre-processing snarks that have a trusted setup where you have the setup that somehow encrypts some queries and encrypts some short answers and, and the prover can compute this short proof and the verifier can uh, very efficiently check it. And they have amazing properties um, especially, you know, the constant verification time and the constant proof sites but they also have one um, major downside, which is this trusted setup. So if this trusted setup was subverted, so if the person who does this trusted setup, uh, if he actually cheats with the prover, if he colludes with the prover, then the prover can compute fake proofs. So what does that mean in zero cash? Well, in zero cash this would mean, or Zcash this would mean that you can spend money, you can create money out of thin air, right? Uh, and this is obviously a terrible, terrible uh, situation. And what maybe even makes it worse is that uh, you, have, you still have the zero knowledge property, so you wouldn't even be able to tell if someone creates money, right? It's not like in Bitcoin if someone is able to create money, it's very easy to see. In, in a confidential currency like Zcash, you would not even be able to tell. So um, the problem with the trusted setup in cryptocurrency is exactly that. And uh, the problem is that it's really undetectable. So you have undetectable subversion means undetectable inflation. So even if I'm not part of a transaction where sort of, you know, money is created, I'm still suffering from it because suddenly there's inflation and my currency is devalued. And the problem is because it's undetectable, even the fear of it is dangerous. So, right, like no one, you know, I don't really know any, any reasonable person that believes that there's any sort of undetectable inflation ha that has happened in Zcash. However, you know, there's really not any good, uh, there can be fear mongering and there's not really that good argument sort of that you can uh, bring up against it other than here we have done everything that we could in our power. But you cannot give a proof that no subversion has happened. Um, and the way to uh, what, what, what Zcash has done and, and where they've done an amazing job, and, and you know, Ian has, has uh, uh, 
uh, done a lot, uh, and, and other people and Sean have done a lot of the work on this, is, is using a distributed setup. So instead of having to trust one person, you say we trust, you know, seven people or better like a hundred people. And uh, as long as one person of them is honest, you're, you're good. So now this sort of seems to uh, really alleviate the fears because, you know, right, how likely is it that a hundred people are colluding together? Um, especially, you know, if you're one of those hundred people, then you can be really sure that n uh, nothing bad has happened. Um, and this is, you know, somewhat expensive and difficult, but it can be done, and it has been done, and, and this has gotten a lot better. The problem, though, is with this, so, you know, are we good now with trusted setup? Well, the problem with trusted setup is, is really not that we can't do it, it's that it's very unflexible. So every time we want to add new functionality, every time we want to change the circuit, every time we want to do an update, we have to do a new setup. So for example, if you want to have a smart contract kind of functionality or a script-like functionality where every transaction is slightly different, every circuit is slightly different, well, what that means is that you have to do a different uh, setup for every circuit. And uh, there's been sort of an academic proposal uh, called Hawk, Hawk, which does a lot more, but basically there you have to do a different setup for every smart contract. And that does not seem very reasonable, or at least it seems a lot more difficult. Um, and th so those are the reasons why we would ideally like to get rid of the trusted setup, or what probably would be almost as good as having a universal trusted setup. So having one setup that isn't circuit specific, but that uh, really works for all circuits. So then we could do it once and then uh, reuse it for all, uh, all applications. So um, with that in mind, or uh, we developed, or we, we, we um, or those were some of the motivations for developing Bulletproofs, which is built on earlier work by the University College London, um, so Jens Grothes group, and it has the properties that it doesn't have a trusted setup and only relies on the discrete log assumptions. And it still has very short proofs. The short are, proofs aren't quite as short as SNARKs, but they're logarithmic in the size of the circuit that you're trying to prove. However, the downside is that now the verification time, which previously was constant, is now linear in the size of the circuit. So we'll see the trade-offs that it has uh, later. And um, uh, in the end, you know, the size of the proof is, is two log to an elements plus uh, 13. Um, and Oh, that's a very good question. So the, the, the assumption is basically the same as, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, the assumption is the same as for Schnorr or ECDSA signatures. So it's an assumption that we're very comfortable with and, and, and trust a lot. It can be uh, subverted by quantum uh, computers, but it's basically a weaker assumption, and weaker means better, because you're assuming less, than what SNARKs use. It's like strictly weaker. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll go into more details what that actually, what the effect of that is. Well, so in terms of proof size, we can see that, you know, now we have short proofs, but they're not as short as SNARKs, right? So this is in bytes, so um, SNARKs are 188 bytes, and, and bulletproofs are, you know, they're logarithmic, they're probably, you will be hard pressed to find a circuit where you get over two kilobytes, but they're not quite as short as SNARKs. However, you know, say this, uh, for the Zcash sampling circuits, the proofs are 1.3 kilobytes roughly. And that is, you know, maybe reasonable. If that's a big question, but, um, you know, if you, if, you, if you told someone, okay, I can give you zero cash, if there were no snarks, we would probably be willing to accept this. Um, there's also Starks, which have come out, and, and those proofs are, while asymptotically they're also logarithmic, um, or I think log squared, they're unfortunately quite um, expensive in, in practically, and the proofs are over 200 kilobytes. So let's compare the different proof systems. So we have bulletproofs, and uh, I guess the second uh, column is supposed to be Sigma protocols, something I'd lost there. And, you know, the proofs, bulletproofs, again, the benefits are that they're pretty short, they have no trusted setup, and you can do batch verification, which I'll talk about in a second. However, the, the, the downside are that they have linear verification time. And uh, if, if we compare this to SNARKs, SNARKs have better proof size, better verification time, but have the downside of the trusted setup and the slightly stronger assumptions. Um, 
And there are many, many more proof systems. So there's Hyrex, VSQL, Ligero, and uh, there's sort of different points in the trade-off space between uh, all of these different properties, which in the trade-off space is quite high dimensional. Um, so let's talk about the verification time, which I said was linear. So we did some work on trying to sort of improve that. So on the left here, we have the sort of, you know, the mathematical verification code, which looks pretty complicated. But if you actually implement it and boil it down and are, are somewhat smart about how you implement it, you can reduce that to something called a multi-exponentiation, which is this thing on the right side, which means you have just a bunch of exponents and a bunch of generators, and you just compute sort of the, um, the product with them. So why is this multi-exponentiation interesting? Well, first of all, there are tricks to improve multi-exponentiation. So if I have a multi-exponentiation of size n, I can do it in n over log n steps, um, roughly. So uh, this is one benefit. But the other benefit um, comes if I have to verify two proofs. So say I'm a miner, and I receive a block with a bunch of transactions, and each of them has, to, uh, has a proof. Well, then I can check all of them at once. So what this means is that I have to check these two equations, right? I have to check A equals 1 and B equals 1. And the other important property is that most of the generators here, you don't have to worry about the math, but just look at the colors. And uh, the important property is that most of the generators, so most of the Gs and Hs, um, are the same for all. They're fixed in the, uh, in the CRS. And um, so I can do some sort of pre-computation on them, or I already know them in advance. And, what this allows me to do is, is this trick, that, this old trick by Belair, Garay, and Rabin, uh, which is called batch verification. So if I want to do these, uh, if I want to check these two proofs, then I can simply take a random scalar, right? I want to check that A equals 1 and B equals 1. This is, I can take a random alpha and then just compute A times B to the alpha equals 1. And with high probability, if A times B to the alpha equals 1, this implies with high probability that A equals 1 and B equals 1. So what does this help us? Well, this helps us do a lot less exponentiation. If you, if you actually map this out, it means that I'd only have to do sort of um, more scalar operations, which are a lot cheaper than exponentiations, and much less uh, exponentiations. And this gives us an, a dramatic speed up. So for example, you know, if I want to verify a range proof, which is a common, uh, which is what bulletproofs are really good in, then this is a, about a factor of 10 speed up. Um, so the other thing that uh, bulletproofs can do is, right, we have, say we're, we're you know, we have this logarithmic scaling. So sort of the more, the, for the proof size. So the bigger the circuit is that you're trying to prove, the more advantage you can take of that. So we thought about, you know, like in, in the, in, a, in a cryptocurrency transaction, there's often many people that want to create a proof. So there's all of these peggies that want to create a proof uh, for themselves because they all want to create a transaction. However, it would be better if they could create one proof together because that combined proof will be shorter than the just concat. How can they do that without revealing their secrets to each other, right? They don't want to reveal, you know, the, the, the secret keys or the amounts that they're spending. The whole idea is to have a privacy-preserving uh, coin. So we developed this thing called an MPC, a multi-party computation, um, specifically for bulletproofs. Uh, there's general tools for this, but we developed a very efficient version of this for bulletproofs, which allows multiple parties to create one proof together. So um, this works if uh, the... Um, uh, in, in sort of a few number, in log a logarithmic number of rounds with very little communication, or you can have three rounds and more communication. So it's an interactive protocol where they send messages to each other, but if they can find each other, in, in Bitcoin this would be called a coin join, then they can create one small proof for all of them together. Um, so the, um, so this would be, uh, this could sort of, you know, if now suddenly you can have group more people together, then the size difference between a snark and, and a bulletproof doesn't become as big anymore. 
The other, we, we also implemented this into the Bitcoin core library, so libsec 256k1 with you know, a constant time prover and, and really spent a lot of work on optimizing the, the verifier. Um, however, you know, uh, we're happy to be beaten, so Kathy, Oleg, and, uh, and Andre, who is here, they, they implemented this in Rust using the curve 25519, spent a lot of time on, on you know, really um, uh, optimizing everything uh, sorry, this should be Henry. I don't know why I wrote. <laughs> um, but uh, so, you know, they spend a lot of time optimizing it, and, and, you know, it might be up to a factor two even faster than, than the LibSec implementation, which I'm really happy about. Um, and so let's talk about some applications. Um, what is Bulletproof good for, right? So, you know, one thing that it's good for is, is Monero. So Monero is actually trying to implement this, and, and you know there's, they send out this this update uh, saying bottom line you know they are awesome they work the fees are low and they're moving into testnet. So Monero will actually use Bulletproof because the previous protocol it's simply just better than the previous protocol that they use. So you know it gives them a large speed up about uh, above the previous protocol that they use because they didn't have uh, use snarks. Another application is is for you know sort of solvency proofs. Um, where, you know, Mt. Gox or say a Bitcoin exchange or a cryptocurrency exchange wants to prove that they're solvent without revealing uh, how much money they have. And we, we had a protocol in 2015 to show how, how you can do that. And uh, with Bulletproof, you know, this becomes even more efficient. The, uh, another thing, I'll actually skip over that. Um, so now let's come to it applications that you might be more interested in. And we heard this uh, talk earlier today about Bolt, uh, and honest payment channels, which is a really cool protocol because, you know, it allows, um, say, for example, it allows many things, but it allows, you know, lightning payments with privacy versus the, the intermediaries or the hubs. And um, it's a really cool protocol. But what's even cooler than Bolt is Bolt with uh, champagne bullets and because it allows you to reduce the proof size. You know, Bolt has... Um, uses range proofs and other proof techniques, and um, this is sort of, you know, these sort of small circuits is what Bulletproof is really good for. Um, don't quote me on these numbers. I sort of very estimated them. So, But it definitely will be shorter than probably what was previously used without a trusted setup. Um, so the question that you're probably most interested in is, would Bulletproof work with Zcash? Well, let's, you know, think about it a little bit, right? The... First, let's think about why we would not want to do this. Well, the main reason is that snarks are really, really cool, right? They're super, super small. They're, you know, uh, asymptotically, they're constant size and, and versus logarithmic size for bulletproofs. And in, even practically, you know, they're almost a factor 10 uh, smaller. And they're also really, really fast. And there the gap is even bigger. And, you know, the snarks are crazy fast. I can prove to you any sort of statement that I want. I, you really have to, this is, this is truly amazing, in, in 10 milliseconds, uh, 10 milliseconds to verify. Um, when you're comparing two sites that are run by the same machine, also contained by the same location, for example, um, the Zcash URL, um, the uh, URL is on the same So maybe for the online audience is that, you know, this is, I'm just talking here about the proof size, not the transaction size. So there's sort of a large constant blob that uh, constant size transaction that will be added to uh, both of these numbers, which will make the difference less severe, right? Because, you know, this constant is uh, both, you have to both pay this in uh, snarks and uh, for bulletproofs. So, and the other thing that snarks can do, right, and, and we've heard some of the, uh, this today, they can really do, do cool things that bulletproofs can do. And, and I think the, the, the main one is, is sort of, you know, the, the coda thing that Isaac talked about is, is that you can do these recursive proofs and you can aggregate things, right? I can uh, prove to you that the whole blockchain is correct in a, in a 288 byte or 188 byte proof. Um, so these are really, really cool things that you just couldn't do with bulletproofs. Um, so why would you do it, though, right? Like, it, it seems to be just worse. Why would you do it? Well, the assumptions are better. The, the discrete lock assumption is, is sort of more trusted. But, you know, unless you're very paranoid, that's probably not a reason. 
A slightly better one is that you don't have to use pairings, uh, and what that means is that you can use sort of better elliptic curves. You know, you can use sec P256K1 or at 25519, which are uh, curves that, you know, we have sort of more trust in, and they're also faster. You know, we have faster implementations than them, for, than the BLS sort of curves that, um, uh, that are used for, for Zcash. Well, the main th reason why you would want to use it, though, is the no trusted setup. So one reason is that you know it instills more confidence. There can be no more sort of fear mongering. No one can say, okay, Zcash, you know, there's, they cheated in their trusted setup, um, and it removes the need for this this MPC. However, the real reason that why you would want to do it is because it enables flexibility. And uh, what this means is that you can sort of update and change the circuit much more easily than without redoing a, an MPC. So for example, you could have adaptive circuits. So you know, in, in, in uh, Zcash, you need to prove that something is in a Merkle tree. And they had to um, fix the size of the Merkle tree in Zcash for all, you know, sort of for until at least the next network upgrade. Um, with bulletproofs, you can just say, OK, how large is our Merkle tree actually? Right? And then just implement the circuit for that instead of you know, having to update it. The other um, big, big benefit that I see with, with a, not having a trusted setup is private scripts. So you know, if you want to sort of have the scripting functionality, um, having a trusted setup for every script is, is really difficult and, and probably not feasible. So, uh, and also, you know, the batch verification closes the gap on verification time, and the aggregate proofs maybe close the gap on proof size. So, what we would really need is some, uh, yeah, so what is the sort of, what is the ugly here? You know, snarks are implemented and work, so never, you know, never change a winning team. Also, updates are really difficult. This, you always have the security of the weakest setup in sort of your chain. So if you really wanted to update to bulletproofs, you have to sort of reveal all values. So the same, this turn style thing that, that is also being done for sampling is uh, the same thing that you would have to do here, because otherwise you would still rely on, on the setup from the, uh, from the snark. So you don't get the benefits unless you do this. And the verifier's dilemma is very dangerous, and I won't go into it, but basically it's very important for sort of out of, from game theoretic reasons, that verification is almost uh, free. So to really judge this, we would need some data. And um, I actually have some data. So, <laughs> um, you know, let's look at uh, some concrete metrics. So the, the simple um, uh, experiment that we ran is showing, you know, how much is a Merkle inclusion proof. And basically, that's the majority of the circuit. So you kind of just have to multiply the numbers by roughly two. Uh, and you get sort of the real uh, estimate. So the proving time is roughly 14 seconds. The verification time is half a second. But now if we do the batch verification, it's only 50 milliseconds. So um, if we uh, compare this, right, like now you can say that the verification would take one second plus 100 uh, milliseconds per transaction. But note that this is on a two gigahertz throttled machine on a single core. So this is not a service style machine. And also, um, the, 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 uh, uh, the team from Chain hasn't put their hands on this. So maybe they will get like a speed up of a factor of two again. So you know, this would be cool. And these numbers, I don't know. Like, are these good enough? You know, I'm, I'm probably not, uh, don't have the expertise to judge this. I would say if you start a new currency, maybe this would be good enough. However, you know, it's always, you always judge sort of things by where you are, and it would be quite this trade-off. So um, it's not, you know, it's not completely impossible, but it's also definitely not a clear choice to go this way. Um, and especially, you know, the, the proof size are larger and scalability is a really important factor. So, um, but at least sort of, I think it's something that is worth exploring more and also worth seeing if there's more optimizations that we can do to improve these numbers. Okay, thank you very much.